We're on. <laughs> oh, well, it's telling me to publish, so. Don't publish that yet. Oh, it's published. It published on its own. Oh. <laughs> Hello! We're finishing getting set up. Dun, 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 dun. Whoa, is it set up? There it is. That should be it. Cool. <laughs> We're getting the sound set up. Hello, and welcome to Better Utah Broadcast. Double checking, there we are, woohoo, okay. Uh, my name is Katie Matheson, I am the Communications Director here at Alliance for a Better Utah. We have recently, um, the staff member who was helping us do these Better Utah Broadcasts was with us through the election, so this is our first episode without him behind the scenes helping out, which is why we're running late. <laughs> So welcome, of course, we have Chase, uh, Executive Director of Alliance for Everybody Utah, Chase Thomas, and Lauren Simpson, who is our Policy Director. Hi. Hi. They both said hi not into the mic, as if they haven't been doing this for months. <laughs> oh my god. All right, so. Hi. We are lazy enough that we don't hold our mics. <laughs> All right. Guys, it's been a week, two weeks since we've done one of these. Last week was Thanksgiving. I'm basically in Christmas mode, so... It's going to be a fun month. All right. So, of course, we do a Better Utah broadcast every Wednesday, except for holidays, at 1230. Please join us. Reminder uh, to click Get Reminder when you see us pop up on your Facebook feed. That way, Facebook will remind you when we're about to go live, so then you can join us. Please say hi in the comments. Ask us questions in the comments. We will be monitoring them to see what you have to say about what we're talking about. So we're kind of doing a little bit of a shift. In the past, we've kind of had guests on, and now we're going to continue to have guests on, movers and shakers in Utah, but we are also going to be featuring more of our staff in the coming weeks and months and years. Um, that's right. You all have to put up with us. That's right. So um, join us every Wednesday for kind of our take on what's going on in Utah news and possibly national news, depending on if somebody from Utah <laughs> Gets in national news, which is sometimes great and sometimes rough. So Yeah, it might be me love soon. Did you see the Utah policy article about her? What did they say? She was going to run for president? She's going to primary Trump? No, that she's going to try and get a news gig. Oh, Fox. She's going to take Chaffetz's seat when he when he uh, runs for governor. Yeah. Great. So. Cool. Yeah. Well, okay. So that's, that is, that <laughs> you is actually. You not seem super excited hold about on, that. That is a part of our conversation. <laughs> but first we have to play a game that I'm forcing you guys to play called Is This Real Life? And of course I read a headline. You guys have to decide whether it's real or fake. Um, and we'll go from there. Reminder, only one person has ever gotten 100%. Um, that's James Singer who ran for the third congressional district. I did once. No, you've never gotten 100%. Wow. <laughs> Sometimes I lose on purpose to make our guests feel better. <laughs> That's called spin. I like it. <laughs> All right, first one. Knickers the cow. Giant steer goes viral after being too big for slaughterhouse. True. True. Oh, man, how'd you guys know? Did you read the news? Uh, oh, is it really? Yeah. <laughs> Dang it. Okay, so this cow is six feet, four inches tall, which is as tall as my dad, which is unfathomable to me and also terrifying. Can you imagine coming up against a six foot, four inch cow in a pasture? Have you seen pic you, you must have seen pictures of this thing. Clearly, I am behind. probably think it was a god. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is the god of cows. <laughs> All right, next one. Pilot misses destination by 29 miles after dozing off false true it's true ah. but the plane he was the only person on the plane so that's good or she i guess either one they were the only ones on the plane so that's good but the airline is taking it very seriously and that's all i know so don't go on their flight all right next one oldest living animal a tortoise named joe found in utah desert false also false. Dang, you guys. That is false. I would name a tortoise. Why are you Joe, saying though? dang? We got it right. I know. I'm mad. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I do not celebrate your success. Your 
success is my failure. That means I didn't make it hard enough. Okay. Katie, your success is my failure. <laughs> when I run for office, that's going to be my, uh, yeah. my tagline. <laughs> Scientists find out seaweed is sentient. False. <laughs> sentient seaweed. False. False, but I hope you all liked the alliteration. It, that was convincing. Okay, good. Last one. That's how I found out I was dead. Soccer club fakes players' demise poorly. True. True. Dang. I know what your <laughs> method is. You were just saying whatever Chase says. <laughs> Wait, does that mean I got 100% right after you said nobody else had gotten 100%? Dang, you did. You did just get 100%. Woo! And Lauren did too. No, she didn't. <laughs> oh. oh, well. And that's why she what learned. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, riding on the coattails. I love it. Okay. All right, friends. Let's get back to serious business. Let's talk about Representative Love, soon to be former Representative Love. Let's talk about her concession speech. So <laughs> she took a little bit of a, she took some time to concede, right? Mm -hmm. She called um, she was Representative Elect, right? I mean, that's plausible. It was Thanksgiving. Disney World. Disney World. <laughs> <laughs> um, she called um, Representative-elect McAdams to concede and congratulate him. I would give anything to have been a fly on the wall for that conversation. Right. Um, and then she had this um, press conference on Monday, and everyone was kind of like, oh, what's going to happen? What's she going to say? And everyone was like, are there going to be more lawsuits? Like, you know. Theories were flying fast and loose. Um, and so I want to know what your guys' thoughts were on her speech, if you have any thoughts. Very fiery. Super fiery. Um, especially for after losing. I mean, it's like, where is this for the past how long she's been in office? Mm -hmm. um, but I guess it's not surprising you see all these politicians doing that. Jeff Flake didn't start speaking out until he said he was retiring. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's disappointing that we didn't have that anti-Trumpness, speaking your mind, being unleashed and untethered for a while now, but hey, at least we finally got it. Yep. What's super interesting is that Utah has a reputation within the state, and I would say nationally too, of like politics is very nice. Mm -hmm. Politicians don't go against the grain, usually... Um, in the state legislature, they tend not to vote no on their colleagues' bills very often compared to other state legislatures. And so to have such a, not just candid, but also like usually concession speeches tend to be really gracious. This one was not. And so it's, it's surprising coming from a Utah politician. Mm -hmm. um, it's also... It's surprising to see also the reaction to that speech. There have been a lot of op-eds written about it. Lots of people are talking about stuff because Love called out Trump. She called out the Republican Party. She called out Democrats, too, and the media. <laughs> she called out us, uh, which we're flattered, but it turns out we actually weren't responsible for it, the things she called us out yeah, for. Yeah, so that was incorrect. But she was calling out a lot of parties and so you have a lot of people saying, like, wow, that was so bold and candid and that she was calling out um, racism within the Republican Party. They don't support minority candidates. We have a president who openly antagonizes minority candidates. Um, and so you have that side. But on the other side, um, it was a lot of blaming other people. Also, she called her. A wolf in sheep's clothing, which is that was intense, shocking. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, especially it was especially I don't know notable that she was blaming every single person for making this a horrible mudslinging race when she was the person that ran the first attack ad. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, take some responsibility. I mean, I didn't expect it, but it's always disappointing not to see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think what's What's fast to me, looking at her as a representative, 
she feels like now that she's out of office, she finally has the ability to speak her mind. And like Chase was saying earlier, it's so it's really sad that we didn't get that sooner, um, that we didn't get to see more of her personality. Um, it's sad that she didn't she felt like she couldn't engage with her constituents. That was a common criticism of her tenure as a representative. So it's really, it's disappointing that we're getting that candor so late, like too late, mm -hmm. you know? And it seems like there could have been, there could have been a path. It would have been a very narrow path. And I'm, I mean, now Ben McAdams is going to have to walk this line of, of course, it's going to be harder for him because he's a Democrat, but you know, the fourth congressional district, is 60% disapproves of Donald Trump. So it seems that there could have been more room, not a lot, but some room for her, at least more room for her than Ben McAdams will have to actually criticize Trump more often than she did. Yeah. And, and, uh, she already didn't show love, so. Right. <laughs> oh, Trump. Um, well, and, and her argument that, you know, she couldn't really speak her mind because she had a lot of different interests to represent in a district, mm -hmm. that actually speaks to the way that Utah is gerrymandered mm -hmm. because that was the intent in 2011. The way the districts were created was to purposely put very different ideological groups, political groups, um, different urban rural people like um, the legislature in 2011 wanted these districts to encompass a wide variety of people. Mm -hmm. And so I think with Mia Love, we see the challenge that it's really difficult to be candid and be yourself and to zealously, you know, perform on your agenda while also feeling like you really have to speak to an entire spectrum where a, a well drawn district makes it easy to represent it, it makes it easier for candidates and politicians to be themselves mm -hmm. and to represent their values and feel like they don't have to be afraid to say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the funny thing about that is, though, that I, I don't feel like – I don't think that she was actually very good at representing the the very, very close district. Um, I happen to live in this district. And while she did regularly throw – well, not regularly. Occasionally, she would throw bones to the more liberal parts of her district, like something that she supported, which I personally support. Um, she wanted to make birth control more accessible, which is so refreshing to see from somebody who's staunchly pro-life, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yes, let's make birth control more accessible. That was great. She also wanted to see prison reforms, particularly for women of color and pregnant women in in um, in jail. Yeah. And that is something that I also support. And she also talked a, a moderate game about climate change, which was great. But then, of course, you look at her voting record and she's got, what, a, like a 7% from, like, organizations that actually follow environmental votes. So in terms of how she voted versus what she said, she did not represent the entirety of her district. And the most telling part of it was, was at the end of the election when she tried to sue to stop Salt Lake County from counting their votes. She, she did not want to represent the entirety of her district. Side note on that, I think it's very, very interesting to watch a Republican in Utah County suppress the votes of his own party, which was essentially what was happening. I don't think it was on, I think it was just total incompetence. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, voter suppression sucks. It sucks when it's for anybody. And yeah. I think that a lot of people, some of them on the right side of the aisle, learned how bad voter suppression is just the worst. So that was super interesting as well. So yeah, interesting. Um, I, I, I have to say that that was, as someone who has followed her career, at least in the past two years, fairly closely, watching her speech, that was my favorite thing I've seen her do. Hmm. Honestly, I thought it was the most honest. And I think that she, I really agreed with some of the stuff that she said. I think that she could have gone further, you know, I mean, but her criticisms of the Republican Party and how they have not opened up to women or people of color in particular, I think that she's exactly right on. I would go further and say it's not just because they're not bringing them into their home. Also, it's because their policies are just not supportive of that. Well, but she, <clears throat> she addressed that sort of by blaming Democrats for not supporting minorities, for just bringing them into the home but not actually having good policies, which I don't agree with. Right, like she's no, saying no. that Democrats are just trying to keep them on poverty programs so they can have mm -hmm. more numbers. Right. But, I mean, I don't agree right. with that. But, yeah. but what she said was, and the, the other side of that that she said was, um, 
conservative policies help these communities and that's what i disagree with yeah. right um but she said you know the reason republicans aren't reaching out to these communities is because they're just using them it's just transactional which i think that's a criticism frankly that could be used for both parties um but the part where i disagree is like maybe these communities are going to the democrats because the democratic party has policies that support them mm -hmm. you know um i mean it would be super interesting to see there was um, an interesting opinion piece in the New York Times um, about her and about the, the party and how she spoke at the 2012 Republican convention and, um, you know. George Pyle in the Salt Lake Tribune lit a fiery opinion. <laughs> yeah, I didn't read that one. Tell us a yeah. little bit about it. Yeah, it was spicy. I mean, it was just like, well, I can't remember. Out, it was um, calling out love for having a thin skin. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, basically. Which was, funnily enough, included in their endorsement of her. When the Salt Lake Tribune endorsed her, yes. they said that she had a thin skin. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. All right. So we're kind of all concluded on that. I, I am genuinely um, I am genuinely excited to see what she's going to do next. I think that it would be, even though I disagree with her on a lot of things, I think it would be super interesting to see where she's going from here. You know, maybe she'll be on TV. Maybe she won't. But, you know. In any case, having more women, women of color in public, in the public life, in the public sphere, I think is very valuable. I just happen to disagree with almost everything she did in office. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll be interesting. All right. Um, you didn't see somebody floating the idea that she should primary Trump? No. Yeah. <laughs> I don't somebody know where I saw that. should Trump. Yeah. It should not be her. No. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Should it be Jeff Flake? <laughs> I don't know. I want Jeff I want to respect Jeff Flake so much, and he brings me so close so many times. Yeah. There's been an argument going on that Mitt Romney will be the new Jeff Flake. Do you guys think that's true? No. no? Why not? Oh, I could see that. Like Jeff, like Jeff Flake pre-retirement announcement or post-retirement announcement? Post-retirement announcement. No. 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 So for our listeners and viewers, um, th that is like – being the most vocal anti-Trump um, Republican. Republican in the Senate. Um, I mean, on Twitter, like in reality, maybe, although he did. Yeah, I mean, like protecting Mueller. <clears throat> Romney agrees with most of Trump's policies. And we've already seen that he hasn't been speaking up all the time about whenever Trump does something stupid. Mm -hmm. um, he said he's only going to do it when it's I can't remember the exact phrasing, but when it's something actually huge, um, which a lot of. Other Republicans do that too. Um, I I don't know. I don't see R Romney hmm. speaking up that much. I mean, he said he was more conservative than Trump on immigration. Yeah, which is not really reflective of Utah. Yeah, and so this is going to be kind of a thing where it's like, what comes first, the opinions of conservative Utahns or the opinions of Mitt Romney? You know, like Utah's not a huge fan of. Trump, although I'm not quite sure what the polling says right now in terms of his favorability across the state. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see how that pushes Romney or if Romney pushes the views of Utahns. Um, it'll be interesting to watch. Yeah. Lots to look for. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Speaking of senators, let's talk about Mike Lee. Hi, Mike Lee. Hi, Mike Lee. So we've called out Mike Lee a couple of times in the past week or two weeks. Um, we called him out for this brief that he filed saying we don't want, what was it, SB 54? Yeah, mm -hmm. get rid of SB 54, mm -hmm. have only the caucuses again. Which provides for a dual path to the ballot for candidates, mm -hmm. right? Um, funnily enough, Mike Lee um, got onto the, got the primary nomination from his party at convention prior to SB 54 being a thing, prior to Count My Vote being a thing, right? Yeah, but then he also took the signature route oh, he after did. SB 54 was a thing. So he's used it. Yeah, and it's but he him. wants to get rid of it. Okay. <laughs> so as an organization, Alliance for Better Utah supports SB 54, which is dual path to the ballot, because we think in general it, um, it puts forward more moderate candidates on both parties. Is that correct? Yeah, and that's one reason. Also, it lets the people be involved um, in the process as well of selecting mm -hmm. who's going to be their nominee on the ballot um, by allowing them to choose whether or not to sign the petitions. Um, 
and then having them go into a primary election rather than going through just the convention system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the reason why signature gathering is important, like you said, um, the caucus or convention system tends to elect more extreme candidates by a small by a small group of people too like a right like fewer than 200 people could have power so that's the issue when we talk about political parties what they have evolved into and what they are now a political party is a large group of people and it shouldn't be controlled by one more extreme elite small group of people Mm -hmm. like if you're a member of a party you deserve to have just as much say as anybody else in that party Mm -hmm. and not be controlled by a really small minority of more extreme activists on who you're allowed to vote for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so they're hoping Dave Bateman at all are hoping that it will, Dave Bateman is of course the wealthy benefactor who basically bailed out the Republican party. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're hoping that um, this lawsuit will go to the Supreme court. Is that right? He bailed out the Republican party and used that as leverage. And he said, if you do not, take this if you do not appeal to the supreme court and try and get them to take it i will pull all of my funding so they're trying to get rid of the dual path to the ballot and then so he's holding them like the you republican said, party had planned on dropping the lawsuit mm-hmm. before but then dave bateman came bailed them out and then made that a condition of that money mm. so that's why it's going to the supreme court this because of conservatism one is rich guy one rich guy <laughs> okay um so one rich guy can change the world yeah <laughs> Now, interestingly, I understand the reasoning behind it. I'm somewhat sympathetic to the reasoning behind not wanting to have simply primaries. And frankly, personally, having not like there's this argument of like, oh, it takes a lot of money to get on the ballot. It takes big names to get on the ballot, which I get because then you have to cater to a bunch more people versus just like targeting the people at the convention, right? Within your party, delegates within your party. I think that the system that we have right now with SB 54, which is a dual path to the ballot, is actually a great way to do it. The, this is a great compromise, honestly. Mm-hmm. The ability to do both, right? We have some prominent, um, moderate-ish, not extremist, I'll say that, Republicans in office or soon to be in office that got into office because of the, the dual pathway. Um, I think that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. So, all right. So um, beyond that, Mike Lee... Um, introduced a criminal justice reform bill thoughts on the first step act just broad strokes we don't have to get into specifics in general in general mike lee is pretty good on criminal justice reform stuff and that's Mm -hmm. not something you see from a lot of other republican senators Mm -hmm. so it's really encouraging that this is one issue where a utah senator is doing a really great job on Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> this First Step Act is a bipartisan bill, um, and <clears throat> criminal justice reform really has become a bipartisan issue mm-hmm. over the past years, um, supported by the ACLU and the Koch brothers. Um, and so <clears throat> this bill would make a lot of changes with prison systems, sentencing reform, um, just a lot of good changes right now. Some Republican senators are concerned about little tiny issues in it. Um, and that's what's holding it up. Um, Cotton. Yeah, Senator Cotton. From Arkansas. He's a jewel. Yeah. A jewel is one word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're actually going back and forth in the public, which is really kind of fun to watch. Um, but, you know, to hear Mike Lee speak about this is super interesting because, on the whole, I disagree. Like, 99.9% of the time with what Mike Lee says. 105%. <laughs> Except for this. This is really, really great. And he's a former prosecutor, I believe. Is that right? Uh, he... He's he's come sure. up against... He's criminal. a lawyer, I know that. Yeah, he's come up against <laughs> this stuff before. And there's actually this um, great interview that KUER just recently did with him. And he talks about one of the reasons um, that he's really pushing for this bill. And he talked about this um, incident where he had a... Um, client who was you know he fell on hard times he's selling marijuana right and as he was selling he was he sold to an informant and when he was selling he had a firearm on his person so he had a federally controlled substance class a whatever it is and he was selling it and because of that he had a minimum sentence of 50 or 55 years and when the judge sentenced him 
he wrote and I, I what was it he said he wrote um that he actually disagreed with his own sentence but he said the judge said his hands were tied <clears throat> yeah. because of these laws mm -hmm. and so it's really great to see um senator lee really champion this bill and he said you know make sure the the punishment fits the crime yeah. and that's really really great and he's also talking about um right now there's a conversation about the ability to kind of get credits so like if you're in um prison and then you take a certain number of classes or you go through however much education or whatever it is then you can reduce your time and he's saying what this does is it produces um, people who are going back into the workforce and ready to get involved in society again. And that's a really, I think, compassionate way and, and smart way to look at criminal justice reform. Yeah, it's a bill that, I mean, it doesn't go all the way from what our current stance is on punishment towards rehabilitation, um, but it's at least a step in the right direction. Right, yeah. And I mean, a lot of the criticisms of it are, at least that I've seen from particularly Senator Cotton, is, you know, these people have done bad things we need to punish them for it which is the traditional american way to look at punishment mm -hmm. um and we know now having looked at other examples in the world that there are better ways to think about criminal justice and we should think about it not in terms of um a punishment like um my child did this and i'm spanking them for it it's like why were you acting this way what systems got you here and then how can we compassionately not put you in jail for revenge as society but instead help you rehabilitate your life yeah. And whatever metric you use to examine criminal justice reform, like it's always a better outcome in terms of keeping families together, you know, kids having two parents in the home, mm -hmm. in terms of the money that we spend as a country on keeping people in prison and putting them there, in terms of helping people really make changes in their lives, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And especially, I mean, kind of tangentially related, but still, like, particularly with that one case where the man was selling marijuana, you, you know, now that Utah has effectively legalized medical cannabis within very strict, you know, whatever, um, I think this makes a lot of sense from a Utah angle. Um, and so if you are so inclined to call Senator Lee's office and just thank him for um, pushing this bill, I think that, that'd be great. I've found personally the staff at Senator Lee's office to be very um, open and receptive to the conversation. So thanks, Senator Lee. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. Oh, and something that I'll, else that's super interesting about this bill, President Trump really supports it. Mm -hmm. VP Pence really supports it. Jared, the son-in-law, really supports it. Whatever he, he does. Right, <laughs> you know, ambassador to something. Um, and then Cory Booker, um, senator from New Jersey, really supports it. So lots of like actual bipartisan support. So we can do one thing. I think we can do it. Of course, um, there's lots of other stuff that is not being heard, but that's another thing. Yeah. Well, and they have three weeks to get everything done. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's how much time lately I've left before their adjournment. Um, mm -hmm. Because after those three weeks are over and they leave D.C., then it resets and they would have to restart the bill completely from the bottom mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. um, on another note, um, Mike Lee blocked the Senate from <clears throat> pushing forward a bill that would protect Mueller Wait, Lee today. Did? Yes, today. Oh, like I thought that was ago. McConnell. Oh, okay. Well, McConnell was saying, no, I wouldn't hear it. But then today, Mike Lee actually went up and said, no, I of don't want this to go forward. So it's a love-hate relationship. <laughs> 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 All right. So now I want to end by... Um, Chase put up a great Twitter thread today under our handle, and I want to kind of talk about it I've a little bit. I've been having a lot of good rants on Twitter lately. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't like a rant that we put up on Twitter, you know who to email. Yeah, I'm our Twitter master. The Twitter master. Puppet master. <laughs> All right. So talk to me about what what you were talking about, Chase. Uh, yeah, so this morning while I was reading through the paper, um, there were a few articles that sort of all linked together for me. Um, <clears throat> on the front page, there was a story about the latest estimates from the U.S. Census Bureau talking about people moving in and out of the state. And there was one line in there that said, like, we all know that Utah is the youngest state in the nation under 31 years of age. Um, and then there was a profile about the youngest lawmaker in Utah. Uh, I can't remember what his name. Oh, yeah. Casey Snyder, I think was his name. Right. Um, and then and Derek Kitchen will be the youngest in January. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I was talking about how he um, went out to D.C. and had no money and could barely live there. Oh, um, sounds like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Yeah. But and, he's conservative. 
Yes. And then also having to scrape by doing politics here in Utah as well. And then another article about Salt Lake City Council yesterday during their council meeting, they started discussing whether or not they should raise the pay of council salary, Mm -hmm. and which is always a very touchy subject. Um, Whenever politicians talk about their own pay raises, everyone goes in an uproar, but they haven't done it for 37 years. Mm -hmm. And so it's getting to the point to where it's only like people up in the avenues and all these other rich areas that could actually serve on the city council. Um, And basically I tied it all together. It's like the way our political service is structured here in Utah. And I mean, even nationally, it's only allows the rich well off um, post careers uh, people to actually serve and give back to their community. Mm -hmm. Um, especially here in Utah, how we have a very condensed legislative session, 45 days. It's all day, every day. Most people can't leave their job for 45 days. They barely get paid anything. Um, so that's one of the reasons why our legislature, the average age is over 60. Um, even though we've been seeing over the past few years, a huge groundswell in young people getting involved in politics, um, and minorities for it's not that there is inherently something wrong or bad with people, people, people post career. Oh, why is that dying? Yep. Oh, people post career to um, volunteer their time and provide a service. Um, the problem is, of course, that it's not reflective of the larger population. So let's talk a little bit about that. Like, why is it important to have people in office who <clears throat> kind of reflect? the general population. Well, well, go ahead. Well, I mean, if you have someone in office that is facing the same issues, problems, worldviews um, across the table as you, they're going to represent your interests better. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're young, struggling with loan debt, um, someone who is young and struggling with loan debt is probably going to represent your interests more um, mm-hmm. in Congress or in the state legislature. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, that's true for every demographic across the board. Um, so just having more reflective government bodies is better just because it better reflects the interests of people. Cool. Yeah. And especially with the legislature, like in a democracy, any body is only as strong as the diversity of lived experience within that body. And so when there's a large chunk of people who <clears throat> aren't at the table, their lived experience goes unnoticed. And so it's not like policies are passed to like punish that group, but it, because nobody's there to say, hey, you haven't thought about this, policies get passed that are worse for that group. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's why it's important to have, um, you know, assuming generally, which I think this is true, that governing bodies tend to be better well off generally more white and generally more male, um, it's important for us to kind of disrupt that status quo as we've seen the Democrats in the House do um, mm-hmm. because then they can speak up to issues not because there's any mal- malintent on the parts of the the status quo necessarily, although sometimes there is, yeah. but it's because they don't have a personal, lived, very real connection with the impacts of those policies. Mm-hmm. Just right. like we saw up at the legislature last year, the story that we always love to tell when there were well, health and services com- subcommittee. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was a group of a bunch of men and a couple women, and the men were sitting there saying, what would I do if I had a uterus? And you say, well, <laughs> well you we just ask a woman. Yeah. <laughs> and then get more women in there to speak to their experiences. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, and I would say, it's like having different voices as part of a body it's not like it's burning. Yes, it is. It's not the heater, is it? No. Okay. I think the heat just went off. Oh. Uh, uh, no. Yeah, it's really not about disrupting. It's not like we need to take away this person's seat. It's about inclusion and creating a better body. And it's tough, you know, if you're like a white male legislator, like it's tough to like be the one who gets cut from the team. Mm-hmm. But like, if you're a patriot. And as a politician, you are, like, what's best for the whole is what you should be doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, and then another example I even just thought of too, why it's important. Um, there was an article yesterday or the day before in Politico about um, with the huge insurge of women in Congress, they're having to make changes to the actual building to make it more accessible. Um, like outside of the house chambers, there was always just a men's restroom and the women had to walk all the way through Statuary Hall to get to their restroom. Seriously? Are you kidding me? And so the architect of the Capitol had to put a restroom closer for the woman. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, they just installed changing tables and all the women were taking pictures outside of the Senate chambers. Um, another thing, women or men can't use their congressional salary for childcare. And there are single mothers who just got elected. You can't use a salary for childcare? You can't use your congressional That's salary. Weird rule. Why can't they have this here, just in case? Why can they control what you use your salary for? Because it's government funds. But it's not government funds once it goes to your your well, account. Yeah, I mean you can. That's so weird. Like yeah. I, I understand campaign finances, which that rule has been changed, and I remember that because Shireen Garbani, there's a big thing about her using being one of the first women to use campaign fi uh, campaign funds for childcare. Mm -hmm. That seems absolutely. Yeah, it was a new um, representative from California who's a single mother and has three kids. And her kids are staying behind in California while she commutes out to D.C. each week. And she's like, I don't know, I'll pay for this somehow, but... And so they're trying to push for a rule change to allow for that. What on earth? Yeah, yeah. so just making government more accessible so everyone can be involved um, at all levels, whether it's local, state, or national. Mm -hmm. So if you have any ideas about this, any thoughts, um, you've been interested in running for a local office, school board, something like that, and there are barriers to you, um, not just, not even on the campaign side, because that, is, that presents a whole other bu bundle of barriers um, in terms of funds, in terms of access, in terms of know-how, in terms of time off of work. Um, yes. But like simply, if you look at it and you simply could not managed to serve because of the pay mm -hmm. or because of whatever other weird rules there are yeah. um let us know we'd be super interested to hear i mean it's it's certainly a topic that will continue to be an issue as utah continues to grow both in influx from people moving in from out of state as um we start to look more diverse um it's going to be an interesting thing to follow so let us know if that's anything that you've considered before all right guys any last thoughts Nope. No. Nope. All right. See you next week, 1230 on Wednesday. Bye. Bye. Thanks.